Hello everyone, today we will discuss WLAN networking architecture. Let's first take a look at the first type of typical network architecture known as the FAT-AP architecture, also called the autonomous network architecture. What does autonomous mean? It means that each FAT-AP can operate independently, without the need for additional centralized control equipment. Keep this in mind, as this is in contrast to our thin AP model. This architecture is easy to deploy and relatively low cost, which refers to the product price perspective. We'll see if it's really cost effective later. When deploying a single AP, it's generally okay to cover an 80 square meter residence. But for an area of 120 to 130 square meters, you will find that the signal strength becomes very weak. This is just in a home environment. In a business context, it's clear that it cannot meet enterprise requirements. This leads us to the concept of ESS, which involves deploying multiple APS. Let's say I need to deploy 20 APs. If I use a FAT AP architecture, I would need to configure each of the 20 independent APs individually because they operate independently. So whether we are configuring, upgrading, or even troubleshooting, we have to perform these operations individually on each AP. Here we see it's only 20 APs, but for a large mall or enterprise, there could be hundreds. Configuring so many APs becomes troublesome. Thus, the labor cost is very high. Therefore, for enterprises, we recommend using the FAT AP architecture. But on the other hand, although FAT APs are more cumbersome, they are still useful in certain scenarios, such as our home wireless routers, which actually operate in a FAT AP mode. FAT APs require a wireless controller, an AC to pair with our APs. FAT APs, by default, cannot work independently. In this architecture, let's look at what APS and ACS do. Firstly, AC primarily handles WLAN, access control, forwarding and statistics, AP configuration monitoring, roaming management, AP network management, security control, all these responsibilities are on the AC. While thin APs handle 802.11 message encryption and decryption, 802.11 physical layer functions, accept management from AC, and simple functions like air interface statistics. We find that AP functionalities are all related to the wireless side, and they are associated with 802.11. At the same time, AC and AP interact via the CAPWAP tunnel. Compared to the FAT AP architecture, thin AP architecture, what are its advantages? First, it is easier to configure and deploy. With FAT APs, configuring 300 APs requires 300 configurations. With AC plus thin AP architecture, configuring 300 APs only requires configurations on the AC. Then, as long as APs can register with the AC, there's no need for 300 individual setups. One setup suffices. Secondly, it offers higher security. Since FAT APs cannot be uniformly upgraded, it's not guaranteed that all APs have the latest security patches. In AC plus thin AP architecture, main security capabilities are on the AC. Software updates and security configurations need only be performed on the AC, allowing quick global security settings. To prevent loading of malicious code, devices authenticate software through digital signatures, enhancing the security of the update process. AC also supports some security functions that FAT AP architecture can't, including virus detection, uniform resource locator filtering, stateful inspection firewall, and other advanced security features. Thirdly, no need to mention updates and scalability. During upgrades, just input a command on the AC, and all APs will be upgraded together. Expansion is the same, allowing for group expansion. The focus of this session is on AC plus thin AP architecture, divided into three parts. First, let's look at network topology including Layer 2 and Layer 3 networking, direct attached and bypass networking, and how data forwarding works. Let's start with Layer 2 and Layer 3 networking. From this diagram, we can see that if the AC and APS are in the same broadcast domain, it constitutes Layer 2 networking. In this scenario, APs can find the AC directly through local broadcast. This type of networking is very simple, simple to configure and simple to manage. Typically, this layer two networking is used in small scale networks. 
Why is that? Because if layer two networking is used in a large network, potentially with hundreds or thousands of APs, then APs and ACs are in one broadcast domain. If a broadcast storm occurs, the impact area naturally becomes much larger. Thus, it's not suitable for large-scale networking. Generally, it's considered viable for networks not exceeding 200 devices. Now let's look at Layer 3 networking. In Layer 3 networking, APs and ACs are in a three-tier architecture. Connected through switches in between, AC and AP are on different network segments. First, APs must be able to communicate with ACs, so some additional configurations are required to ensure APs can discover ACs. Layer 3 networking is widely used, especially in medium to large campuses, where each building might be covered by an AP. This describes the Layer 2 and Layer 3 networking architectures. Now, let's consider Direct Connect and Bypass networking. For Direct Connect networking, typically, the AC acts both as a wireless access controller and a convergence switch. That means when APs send data, it must go through the AC. That's the essence of Direct Connect networking. On the right, the AC in a bypass switch setup means that AP data does not necessarily go through the AC. This setup is a bypass networking model. So how do we choose between direct connect and bypass? Let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of each networking model. Firstly, in a direct connect network, the AC can act as a convergence switch. However, this setup poses a challenge because our typical networks might combine wired and wireless deployments, not necessarily isolated. This means other switches might be connected to this switch with PCs or wired business devices below those other switches, and thus wired data might also pass through our AC, meaning the AC must handle both wireless and wired user data. The AC would be under considerable stress. So generally speaking, if there is a mixed deployment of wired and wireless, then definitely do not use Direct Connect networking. If it's just a wireless network, Direct Connect networking can be used. In bypass networking, wired data does not pass through the AC. Also, in bypass networking, wireless data can bypass the AC, meaning the AC only acts as a manager. Generally speaking, small to medium networks use Direct Connect, but for large or revamped networks, we would use bypass. Let's continue with data forwarding methods. Data forwarding methods first involve the CAPWAP protocol, which carries both control information and user information and user data. Because there might be control data transmitted between the AP and AC, like when the AC sends down configurations. Managing APs involves passing control information. It might also transmit user data, like when a mobile user connects to the AP to access the internet, that's user data running. If it's bypass networking going through the AC, then it definitely goes through a CAPWAP tunnel. So CAPWAP tunnel is divided into two types, one called control tunnel and one called data tunnel. Here is a CAPWAP tunnel. And regarding this, we will specifically discuss what a CAPWAP tunnel is in the working principles section. So through the CAPWAP tunnel, we introduce two forwarding methods, one called direct forwarding and the other called tunnel forwarding. Let's look at direct forwarding here. Here, the AP and AC have established a CAPWAP tunnel, so control traffic will 100% go through the CAPWAP tunnel. But data traffic, when a mobile phone connects to the AP to access the internet, it works like this. It does not go through the AC. This forwarding method is called direct forwarding. It bypasses the CAPWAP tunnel's encapsulation and is directly forwarded to the upper network. The AC only manages the AP, and all business data is forwarded locally, so it's also called local forwarding. It has an advantage. The data traffic does not go through the AC, so the AC has no burden. Let's continue to the second, tunnel forwarding. Control data is the same. It goes through the CAPWAP tunnel, but user data first travels through the CAPWAP tunnel to the AC, and then the AC forwards it outward. This we call tunnel forwarding. Business data travels encapsulated through the CAPWAP tunnel to the AC, and then AC centrally forwards it. So sometimes we call it centralized forwarding. The AC not only manages the AP, and also acts as the traffic hub for the APs. 
it has a significant downside, which is that the data travels through a convergence switch to the AC and then upwards. Thus, the traffic takes an extra loop, making the path suboptimal. But this makes it easier to implement security control policies for wireless users. We've now covered layer two thirds networking, directly connected networks, side mounted networks, as well as direct and tunnel forwarding modes. So there are several combinations of these six methods. The most common ones are shown in the table. The first method involves no detours for data traffic and has high forwarding efficiency. Side mounted plus layer two plus direct forwarding also has no detours for traffic and is highly efficient in forwarding. It also facilitates the integration of WLAN in an existing network because the AC is side mounted and network architecture doesn't need to be altered during remodeling. Let's look at side mounted plus layer two plus tunnel forwarding, which actually uses the same architecture as the second method, still at layer two, but its traffic takes a detour, first running to the AC and then out. The last two networking methods are the most commonly used by users, depending on your needs. If the traffic is heavy, direct forwarding might be better, because in cases of high user concurrency, the AC might not be able to handle it. If the traffic doesn't make the AC a bottleneck, tunnel forwarding can be considered. Let's continue with network planning, including VLAN and IP address planning. There are basically two types of VLANs, management VLAN and service VLAN. In wired networks, these also include management and service VLANs. But note that WLAN's management VLAN is different from wired network's VLAN. In WLAN, it's typically called the VLAN for managing APs. And it also carries CAPWAP tunnel forwarded packets, including management messages and service data packets forwarded through CAPWAP tunnels. Now, let's look at the service VLAN. Service VLAN is responsible for carrying service data packets. We usually divide it into various forms, based on departments or services, to form different VLANs. Service VLAN isn't just one. It can be divided into multiple VLANs, such as 20, 60, 80. Maybe 20 is for Department A, 60 is for Department B, and 80 is for Department C. At the same time, we can base it on the nature of the business, employee levels, etc., to divide into various VLANs. Then, let's see what to consider when dividing VLANs. First, try to separate the management VLAN from the service VLAN, then, based on actual business needs, bind SSIDs. This means SSID will be associated with specific services. We recommend several methods here regarding the mapping relationships between SSID and service VLANs. First, the one-to-one -one mapping is commonly used, but this is for smaller networks. Let's look at area A and area B in a business district. These are two different areas, but we can allow users to detect the same WLAN signal. Area A is called guest and area B is also called guest. Also, if I need to apply the same data forwarding control policy, then our SSID and VLAN can be planned together. Another method is one to N, one SSID with different VLANs. Let's see how this scenario applies. The enterprise needs to cover area A and area B with WLAN, firstly requiring the signal to be the same, but with different data forwarding control policies. So when binding the templates, two VAP templates use the same SSID but different business VLANs are used. Be careful not to use this approach in the same area. Why is that? If two methods are used in the same area, we would not know which one is connected. Also, having multiple SSIDs mapped to one VLAN is not recommended and is less commonly used. It's used less frequently. Enterprises need to cover area A and area B with WLAN, hoping that users can search the WLAN and understand location information etc., but can adopt the same data forwarding control policy. Then you can plan two SSIDs for one VLAN. But this use is less common. Generally, different areas use different VLANs, also adopting the same data forwarding policy. And there is a type end to n This definitely is the most used. Different SSIDs correspond to different VLANs based on the business division. When covering area A and B with WLAN, not only understand the location information, but also distinguish different data forwarding methods. Planning this part also includes IP address planning. These three aspects are what we need to focus on. The source address of the AC, 
the IP address of the AP, which is our management address, and the IP address of the terminals are our business addresses. First, the source address of the AC, if it is a layer two network, of course, it is the interface address. If it is a layer three network, we can use its interface address or a loop back address can be used. Now looking at the management address of the AP, which is used for CAPWAP communication with the AC. So we understand that the source of the AC must be able to communicate with our AP's management address. Due to the large number of APs, it is common to use a DHCP server to dynamically allocate IP addresses. If it's a layer three network, an option must be configured to enable APs to discover the AC source. Finally, the IP addresses of the terminals. Terminal IP addresses can be allocated in the same way as wired networks. It is recommended to dynamically allocate IP addresses through DHCP. If it is a fixed wireless terminal, it can be configured statically. This concludes the planning of IP addresses.